and welcome to Culture here on I-24 News. I'm Meredith Ross sitting in for Odette Grober. Today on the show, we'll talk about legendary drummer Dudu and D.I. Rose, who passed away last week. We'll hear about his career and talk to one of his close students. And we'll see an unlikely comedy duo, a Jew and an Arab, together on stage. And now to our first topic. Legendary Senegalese drummer Dudu Ndi Rose died in Dakar last week at the age of 85. Considered one of the greatest African percussionists, he was named a living legend by UNESCO and was celebrated around the world. With me in studio is Ben Ayalone, formerly of the band Black Guru, who is a student of Rose, and he's here to tell us about him. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. But first, let's begin by watching a report made a few years ago when Rose was 80 years old and still at the height of his career. To listen to Dudu in D.I. Rose is to hear the rhythm of Senegal. Now 80 years old, the musician still leads a troupe of 15 percussionists and is more popular than ever. Practicing with his family on a terrace in Dakar's HLM neighborhood, the master feels he's finally come of age. The elders wanted to see whether I have now truly learned my craft. They announced that from today I'm appointed chief drummer. As a young man, Dudu went to every remote corner of Senegal to develop his craft. His career has been long and rich. Former President Leopold Sedar Senghor asked him to write an Africanized version of the national anthem, and UNESCO has classed him a living human treasure. He has four wives and 30 children, and none of them can escape the music. Some make these skin-covered hand drums called djembis, and others simply play. His 50-year-old son Mustafa teaches percussion in Paris and now trains young people in Dakar. It's a family affair where really no one misses out. Everyone was born with a beat in them, and I think we'll die with it. The young members of the family regularly practice on the terrace. Even Papi, not yet four, wants to follow in his brother's footsteps. Right now, I'm not afraid of anything at all, because my players, my children, they've all learned the language of percussion. By inspiring so many younger people to play, Dudu's ensured the ancient rhythms of Senegal can be passed down through future generations. So, Ben, uh, you were obviously a student of his, and for our viewers who maybe aren't so familiar with his work, what was so special about this man? He was uh, an innovator. He used to invent new rhythms and to keep and still keep uh, tradition inside and uh, one of his uh, most uh, important things he did he for example he took uh, women and made a, a group of women I think the name was Les Rosettes mm -hmm. and he made a group of women playing it was the first time ever in Senegal it was like he really tried to 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 like you said kind of innovate Innovate and, and to, I don't know what to say, uh, to, to cut borders. Yeah, because that isn't, so that wasn't a common thing for women to no, be playing percussion. No, no. It was mostly a male dominated but thing. Uh, but so you said he invented hundreds of rhythms. So, like, what, what does it take to invent this a is, rhythm? This is, what the, this is what they say. They say like 500 rhythms. I don't know what, wow. what actually it means, but I can tell you that the rhythms in Senegal, in the Sabar music, what happens is that you have like, uh, a groove, uh, a rhythm, and you have compositions that that are played over it. And I think that when people say 500 rhythms, they mean compositions because mm -hmm. it's uh, long compositions of rhythmic uh, phrases mm -hmm. that, which are played played on sabar drums. Um, that I think he invented. So you mentioned the sabar. Is this what we're seeing? Is this a sabar? Is this a, yeah. the drum itself? And, and sabar is a language. Mm -hmm. It's a culture. It's a dance. It's it's a whole thing, so um, you can call it sabar drums, but every every drum has a name, but the, 
the name in total. It's so it's surprising. broader than it's broader than just yeah. the drum itself. It's a it's culture. A, it's a cultural uh, term. Yeah. Okay, I understand. So so it was also like we were just watching this uh, this report together here in studio, and you were telling me, I know this guy, I know that guy. Yeah, These were you've been here uh, to to Senegal. You met members of his family, and he played a lot with his family. This he, yes. he was a, a family musician. Yes. Um, his family is it's like his tribe. So everybody plays his rhythms. In Senegal, it's divided to families. And uh, the Ndiaro's family is the biggest, most famous family. And uh, I know these guys because I was there. I, I studied with them and I recorded them to my album, mm -hmm. in my album, and uh, I know them. You know, it's, so it's really nice to see this, these uh, old videos, but I already know these guys. So but familiar faces for yeah. you. So one has to wonder, how does a, a young Israeli guy Get to, get to meet him, travel to Senegal. How did, how did this all set up? Uh, it's a complicated story. It began when I started learning here with Sabo Labangua. It's my teacher from Kalku. He lives here in Israel. I traveled with him twice to the Gambia, which is a small state inside uh, Senegal. Mm -hmm. I was arrested, long story, deported to Senegal. Then I found out about, about uh, Sabar music. And my teacher, my Israeli teacher, Nir Nakav, he showed me some videos of Dudu Ndiaye just, just about that time. So everything came up and I, uh, together and I just said I have to, to meet this, this legend. Yeah. And I found out a number of, uh, an email or a number of his, one of his sons and just met with them in, in uh, Senegal to study mm -hmm. one time. And then the second time I was there, in, fourth time in Africa in total, but second time in Senegal, I... I I record. I, you see this this video. Uh, I, oh, I got the chance. Cool. I got the chance to meet him in person and to study wow. with him. Wow, that is very cool. So it sounds like a lot of kind of complex, random events led yes. you almost in a fateful way yeah. to be his student. What was he like as a teacher and as a person? Well, as a teacher, you have a you have a proof that he was a great teacher because he invented something and just passed it to his children and grandchildren and, and everybody. Ad, like uh, you say, um, adores. How mm -hmm. you say? Like he's a he's a master, master drummer. Mm -hmm. So and how did, about I wonder, teaching. Like, how did you communicate during the lessons? Was it, I mean, did he speak English you know, you or was it? just have to play. It's just it's just the language of music, wasn't it? No, you just play, just play. Most of the, the lessons were with his sons because he's old. He doesn't come to to lessons. Uh, he came like twice, three times to 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 teach, but. I uh, I used his uh, rhythms and, uh, and compositions to develop a new drumming, which you can see I use a different uh, technique which I developed uh -huh. to play his rhythms. So next time I came to Senegal, I showed him. Uh, what did he think of that? And he gave me his approval. Oh, that's and, great. Uh, which was really good. And um, this is why he wanted to record in my album. So uh, yeah, we, had, I mean, we, had, we had some special connection. It also just really it speaks of you as an artist, because that's what artists do. They don't just copy. They, they reinterpret yeah. and invent this new is methods. Why, what, this is why he, he, he liked it, because it was something new. Yeah. It's, it wasn't like a white man trying to play like Africans. It was something new that's going on with his music. So you put your own twist on it. it. Yeah. So tell us about, about your work and how, how his music has influenced what you're doing today. Uh, yeah, so I have a solo act which is called One Man Tribe, which is actually my uh, way of playing the rhythms. They play like 40 people. I try to, to imitate the sound and to play the rhythms by myself. So, so this is what I do alone, but I also take the rhythms and concepts of music and try to compose things around it. Not, to, not trying to imitate anything, just to trying to do something new with the uh, concepts of music. Right. And, and, you know, here in Israel, is there a lot of uh, African music influence? Are you seeing this uh, in the Israeli musical arena very much? African, as African, yes. But Sabar music is not well known here. I mean, people don't know about it. In, uh, in Europe and uh, French States people know Sabar, but in Israel nobody nobody knows it. I mean, I think I'm the I me and my friends are the only one who knows. Well, that's what it. you're here for, and yeah. and I really do wish you the best of luck. This has been a really nice interview, uh, learning about him and also about how it influenced you and how you've taken it in a whole new direction. We wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thanks much. so much for being here, Ben. Thank you.
And moving on, a rabbi and a Muslim have been doing stand-up comedy side by side for 13 years, touring all over North America, bringing laughs to people of all religions. Bob Alper and Ahmed Ahmed recently performed their successful act in Israel and in the Palestinian territories. Daniel Campos and Pazi Dunk were at their show in Tel Aviv to find out more about their friendship and, of course, their jokes. You've been watching us for quite a while. You've probably noticed we are really kind of a an odd pairing. And Their friendship that, uh, begins 1,500 B.C. Bob kidnapped me when I was a child. I was just yeah. a little baby. In a basket. I was floating down the river. I thought he was Moses. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was I wrong? <laughs> so, yeah, we, start, we started, this is actually our, our 13th year of our mitzvah year. Bob Alper and Ahmed Ahmed are not your typical double act. A reformed Jewish rabbi and a secular Muslim, they have been nonetheless entertaining audiences together for over a decade. Uh, we started because I had a publicist who said to raise our vis my visibility, I should, you know, maybe do a show with an Arab comedian, and I wasn't interested. You know, it wasn't the Arab Jewish thing, it was just I wasn't interested in working with another comedian because they're pretty neurotic. For Ahmed, the proposal came at the right time. I had a bunch of gigs that were lined up in comedy clubs before 9-11. And uh, when 9-11 happened, they were all canceled. The club owners said, we don't feel safe. People aren't going to want to watch an Arab comedian. There's nothing funny about it. And so my schedule was wide open. So far, the collaboration has been fruitful for both. It's been very rewarding on a, on a, you know, so many different levels, you know, spiritually and <clears throat> culturally, religiously, financially. <laughs> I mean, last night, you know, we, we did a show, there was probably like 75, uh, 80 Jewish people in the audience. An older crowd, you know, mostly people over 40. And I came out on stage and I said, hi, my name's Ahmed Ahmed and I was raised Muslim. And it was quiet and I just went, boo. And at first, everyone went. <laughs> For the Arab American, comedy is also about freedom. For me, comedy is supposed to be uncomfortable. But for me, it's just freedom of speech. And that's what we have in America is freedom of speech. And I know, you know, in the Middle East and in the Arab world, comedy, stand up comedy, contemporary stand up comedy is such a new sort of platform and, and art form. For Alper, performing in front of Muslim audiences helps break the ice. I performed at Muslim Fest in Toronto and, you know, I got out on the stage there and there's 2,000 Muslims and me with a microphone and a pole. I looked out, I said, I feel really strange here, so alone, totally out of place. I said, think of it, all of you, all of you are uh, Canadians and I'm American. So. <laughs> Ahmed was born in Egypt and raised in California. He appeared in Adam Sandler's You Don't Mess With the Zohan and in the TBS show Sullivan and Son, produced by Vince Vaughn. It's supply and demand. Here you have a tall, blonde, Christian American, and here we have a camel-riding, turban-wearing terrorist. Hey, I was born here. I'm as American as you are. Yeah, tell it to the TSA. Ahmed's specialty are airport jokes. Every time I go to the airport, they always throw me in the brown room. If you don't know what the brown room is, it's the room where they detain Arabs and Muslims. There was a white guy with a tan in the brown room one time. No joke, I walked by, I'm like, are you even supposed to be in here, man? He's like, oh, I was in the sun for too long and uh, got a bit of a cold. When I came through security, I coughed. <laughs> they thought I was an Arab and they threw me in this room. Alper pursued a career in comedy in 1986 after working for 14 years as a rabbi. His specialty are jokes that deal with religion. Years ago, there was a show on American TV called Kids Say the Darndest Things, and the host, Art Linkletter, would talk to children. And one time, he saw a little boy looking really sad. He said, what's the matter? He said, well, my dog died. And Linkletter, Linkletter said, well, now your dog's in heaven. And the kid says, what does God want with a dead dog? <laughs> To end each one of their performances at the Laugh and Peace comedy tour, Ahmed and Alper ended on their optimistic note that peace is possible. We think there could be healing if all of us together could simply learn Irish, Irish dancing. dancing.
Those guys are hilarious. It would be nice to see more of that kind of cooperation in comedy. And that's all for now. Thank you for watching. Tune in tomorrow, same time, same place, for everything culture. Have a great day. And we'll leave you today with the music of the late Dudu and D.I. Rose and his orchestra performing the Abote.